Welcome back to Restore Gospel Podcast with Corey Stark, continuing his teaching on the Gentiles' fate, and I'll turn it over to him. Well, good morning. Thanks for having me back, Mike. We talked from the first book of Nephi, chapter 7, last time about words soon and speedily and how those meanings may have meant something different when Nephi was writing them in hundreds of years B.C., uh, but what I want to do is quickly recap that and then move on and show a comparison to how it applies to our day. And I, I think this might be informative. It may not speak to everyone. I acknowledge that. I don't claim to be an expert in things like Hebrew, but I, I want to lean on things I've learned in, in reading uh, to maybe illuminate this a little bit more. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch over into my uh, presenter view, which you can't see, and that will allow me to <clears> scroll through slides. So um, what we're going to do is do a little recap, and then I want to talk about this term fighting against Zion, and just something that I've learned really in the last week or so, and Mike and I have discussed this with Shane, uh, and, and see what you think. So um, here we go. Let me get uh, into the mode here. So last time we were together, uh, we discussed this from the first book of Nephi, chapter 7, which is the first book of Nephi, chapter 22 and 23 in the LDS. But the words soon and speedily, to us, they convey an idea of imminence, something that's immediate, going to happen. But they also, in the Hebrew, convey an idea of assurance or certainty, something that's guaranteed to happen, even though that may not be immediate. And we talked about these, these words of like karaf, which could mean soon, it can indicate something quickly to happen, but it also means something is certain to happen. And we also mentioned this word speedily, maher, which can mean quickly or swiftly, but when it's used in a prayerful or prophetic context, it can indicate something that is certain instead of just immediate. So, uh, and then we shared a few of these scriptures. Again, these are all from 1 Nephi 7. The day soon cometh that all the proud and wicked will be as stubble. The time soon cometh that the fullness of the wrath of God shall be poured out upon the children of men. The time cometh speedily that Satan will have no more power over the hearts of the children of men. Keep in mind, these are written around 600 BC. Uh, and, and then we see in context how these words work, that the kingdom of the devil that will be built up among the children of men uh, will speedily come to an end. The time speedily come that all the churches built to get gain, built to get power over the flesh, built to become popular in the eyes of the world, seeking the lusts of the flesh, the things of the world, doing all manner of iniquity, and find all they which belong to the kingdom of the devil, it is they which need fear and tremble and quake. So th these prophecies all work together, but again, that kingdom of the devil ha has not collapsed yet by any stretch of the word. And again, these were written, you know, over 2,500 years ago in, in our days, from our day back to then. So again, when we see these words speedily, it certainly did not mean immediately. Um, just more of the same, the time speedily cometh that the righteous will be led up as calves of the stall. Uh, he will preserve the righteous by his power, even if it so be that the fullness of his wrath must come. And, and we worked into that uh, another term from the same chapter. The things that must happen are the things that are assured and guaranteed to happen. Uh, so I say unto you, these things must come. Blood, fire, vapor of smoke must come. And um, in fact, I, I missed it here. It, it's repeated there in the same verse. The time surely must come that all they which fight against Zion shall be cut off. Now, when we consider that these things are statements of a guarantee, but not guarantees of immediacy, you know, they're, they're talking of the assurance, but not just imminent. Um, it, it causes us to have to reflect and say, okay, so what was the point of this? Um, I, I find this interesting because and this just jumped out at me in recent study. It's not something I was born with. And I had I been, I think I would have been confused over the years. But what I want to do is I want to compare the second part of this verse. These things must shortly come. Even blood and fire and vapor of smoke must come. 
Now, these are Nephi's words, but what we also find is in the Doctrine and Covenants, and this is in the RLDS section 45. I, I'm sorry I didn't cross-reference this with the LDS version, but the wording is the same. Um, where in our recent revelations to saints, it states, they shall see signs, wonders, they shall be shown forth in the heavens above and in the earth beneath. <clears throat> they shall behold blood and fire and vapors of smoke, <clears throat> excuse me, before the day of the Lord shall come. The sun shall be darkened, the moon be turned to blood, and stars fall from heaven. And then it talks about a remnant being gathered unto this place, and they shall look for me, and behold, I will come. So <clears throat> what, what's interesting to me is that when you consider what Nephi wrote in 1 Nephi 7.38, blood, fire, vapor of smoke must come. This isn't just a coincidence. These are the same words. And they shall behold blood and fire and vapor of smoke before the day of the Lord shall come. That's pretty much a direct quote from 1 Nephi 7.38 without referencing it. Now, when I was young and I was just interested in these scriptures. I remember in my early teens reading through the Book of Mormon and then reading through the Doctrine and Covenants. And, and part of that, to be honest, was aided by the fact that I was in trouble often and I got grounded to my room for days at a time. So sometimes in that time, <laughs> wow. I just found my I found myself reading the only books I owned at the time. And they were the scriptures that my mom gave to me when I was baptized. But that's where I fell in love with this. And I, I have to say, I, when I read the DNC about blood and fire and vapors of smoke and, you know, about to come and the remnant gathered into this place, which was Jackson County, um, that created a sense of immediacy in me. And, and then I, I never made this connection though. I never saw that. No, those words aren't original to the Latter-day Saints in the 1830s. They're original to the Book of Mormon from, you know, 2,500 BC roughly. And then, Furthermore, so this quote from Isaiah, the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. See, we start to get a piece of this in, in the second part of the Doctrine and Covenants verse. And I'm looking at Doctrine and Covenants section 45, 6c. The first part of this comes from Nephi's writings. The second part of this comes from various places in the Old Testament. I read one from Isaiah 13, but Joel 2.31, it's even more direct. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. You know, and this is what we have. The sun shall be darkened and the moon be turned into blood. Now, what's different is in Joel's writings, uh, he uses this form of Hebrew parallelism called ellipsis, where there's an omission of a verb or a noun or sometimes both. The sun shall be turned into blood, into darkness, and the moon into blood. It makes sense to us, but what's omitted is shall be turned into. That's stated in the part about the sun, but it's not stated about the part of the moon. Anyhow, the point being, this whole verse, I, I can only speak for myself. I can't speak for anyone else. Uh, I I'm not out to do a hit job somehow on the Doctrine and Covenants. I just want to call our attention to something that this whole verse in the Doctrine and Covenants, even if it, you call it scripture and modern day revelation, it certainly wasn't modern, okay? And it certainly wasn't new, but the context it was used in was extremely new because all of a sudden it equated these events, blood and fire and vapor, smoke, sun being darkened, moon being turned to blood, stars falling from heaven, all these things that were stated, you know, well before Jesus, but now it was equating them with a time period when this remnant, the Gentiles of our church were calling themselves the remnant being gathered into this place. And they'll look for me and behold, I will come. See, what, what I'm realizing here is we being the Gentiles of the latter days, and I'm not differentiating between RLDS, LDS, you know, restoration groups, temple lot. Nephi didn't either, by the way. You know, we were all just Gentiles to him. That's the only thing he ever calls us is Gentiles. But we called ourselves a remnant. And the real remnant were the descendants of Joseph who live on this land yet today. But 
but we were all of a sudden stating we are the remnant and we're going to be gathered. That isn't, it's, I don't want to just state it without supporting it. I will support it, but it isn't how the Book of Mormon ever reads. The Book of hey, Mormon, really, yeah. So, oh, sorry, I, would, I don't want, want you to lose your train no, of ahead. thought. Uh, so a couple of things comes to mind. Number one, it's it's nothing. There's nothing wrong with uh, using um, explanation or scripture or even revelation and quoting previous scripture. Right, that happens in the New Testament. And I find more and more things I thought were cool in the New Testament was Jesus or or other people quoting Old Testament, and it was kind of understood among the people that because they were so um, literate in their scriptures, the way they worshipped, that they would even quote part of an Old Testament. And people knew right. the context of it. But and, and I wanted to ask. Too, I was just going to say to your point right there, the New Testament people were still Old Testament people. I mean, they were keeping the law of Moses up to the time of Jesus' death. And, you know, we've made it a New Testament, but they didn't differentiate, you know, really. Right. They, they were right. Go ahead. So I think the key here is, is um, you know, I don't think any, not that it's an issue that, you know, maybe Joseph was using Old Testament scripture but or Book of Mormon scripture, but perhaps this timeline of the remnant being gathered under this place. So these Old Testament scriptures, what are they? What's the timeline and context? Like Isaiah and Joel, are they talking about Jesus coming the first time? Are they talking about the last days before the kingdom of heaven comes down to earth? Do you because it's hard to see in context here, right? And and this is where honestly. Um... The answer to that question, to find the yes. answer, you really have to look to what Jesus says in Third Nephi, and and he does put a timeline to it. I'm not going to say one of these uh, a timeline doesn't exist, but where Nephi writes and Isaiah write and Joel write, they don't really um, disclose a timeline in these words, because my point is this: their words are more about the guarantee of it it's guaranteed that these covenants are going to be fulfilled. And so um, we'll, we'll try to unfold some of that, I think, the, the timeline. And again, the last session, this is kind of why I'm recapping, talked about those eight signposts. Well, those eight signposts are part of the timeline. None of them have been fulfilled yet, okay? Um, when the Book of Mormon comes to the Gentiles through Joseph Smith Jr., I think the biggest mistake they made was they assumed that meant it was the end of time, and they were incorrect. When the Book of Mormon came, it was the beginning of the second time of the Gentiles, or the last time of the Gentiles, but it wasn't the end. And so this, um, again, it, it's complex, and I know we're digging in a little deep here. And again, my purpose isn't to try to say, well, you know, we can't trust the Doctrine and Covenants, but as you point out, yeah, there's nothing wrong with borrowing Scripture, but the error comes in when all of a sudden you put the wrong timeline to it. And the saints have been guilty of this since the beginning. I mean, we, we just assume, you know, and I have a few more scriptures that point this out, uh, that they assumed everything was going to happen, you know, the next day. And it, some of that comes from, most of it really comes from the Doctrine and Covenants. I, I don't have in this slide series a list of patriarchal blessing messages that were given through Joseph Smith Sr., but they get even more pointed in things to the fact, you know, things of timelines, if you will, like, hey, Zion's going to be redeemed within right. the next year, and you're going to transport yourself to the city of Enoch, and things like this, which, you know, honestly, I just don't think were true. But that all put this sense of immediacy back in our people. So, yeah, okay. I, I, I don't know. I, I know I'm being a, neb a little nebulous, but I think this the, the greater point of all of the Old Testament and Nephi's writings is they were talking about the surety of it. They were talking about how it was guaranteed to happen, but but they weren't putting it on a date on the calendar. And that's the unfortunate error that Joseph Smith and others around him seemed to make is they were kind of nailing right. it down on the calendar now. This morning so, I was thinking just because we uh, get accused sometimes of trying to tear down things or, or but I, the, the purpose to this, and I was thinking about why is this important to me, it's it's about hope and how we view our entire existence as a restoration body. You know, we look back in history and say it's just one failure after another. And, you know, every generation that failed to build Zion, you know, just couldn't be righteous. And, and it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy of, 
you know, why should it, it's a, it, you get this defeatist mentality. Like, why should we even try? None of our ancestors could do it. You know, we're failing miserably. We're dividing and the call keeps coming out to be one. And what's keeping us from Zion? You know, what's in your heart that's not allowing Zion. And that to me is not hope. But when I look back and see, well, God's got a perfect timing. It will be. My hope just becomes getting to know Jesus and allowing things to fall into place. And when when enough people know Jesus in their heart and are and have a heart of Jesus within him, then whatever is going to come, we're going to be part of the Lord's work. And if, if we don't, then we're not going to be. And so shifting my focus gives me much more hope and something I can have control over from day to day. Whereas these things, I don't want to feel like I'm failing every single day along with my brothers and sisters because we're just not good enough, right? We're just, as soon as we're righteous, Zion will come. And that's, that's not the, that's not the complete story. So getting the complete story out to me is getting a story of hope out and changing our view of our history and, and failure. Exactly. That's exactly it. it. It's that hope in Jesus. And, and it's a larger hope than what we have allowed ourselves to enjoy in, in those scriptures, like, Zion's no further or closer or further away than the condition of the hearts of my people. You know, we've heard that and then we've used that, like you say, for the, uh, the reason, but we've also limited that to thinking it's about the Gentiles and where that scripture, I think misses the point is that the, the signposts to fulfill Zion's return is that it's the hearts of the remnant, the true remnant, not us who call ourselves a remnant, but it's the heart of the blood remnant of Nephi's descendants, who when their hearts turn back, then these things begin to unfold. So yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, I, I wanted to show you this next slide. So it's the same information. I just squished it down to, to sort of summarize that what we just said, the DC scripture, Doctrine and Covenant scripture was not original, although I thought it was. Um, it came from the ancient texts of Nephi, Jacob, and Joel. But and here's the issue. It caused people in the 1830s to believe that these events were then to be at hand. And, and still to this day, Mike, I think we hear these scriptures from the Doctrine and Covenants read often, and it's, it sends a chill down your spine thinking blood and fire and vapors of smoke. And, you know, you see that expressed in all different ways, especially among, oh, there's always been at least one or two groups who are way into the prepping thing. And, that creates a sense of immediacy. That creates a sense of, <clears throat> oh my gosh, you know, we don't have much time. Let's stockpile everything because these vapors of smoke and blood and fire are coming. I, I know, and I'm not saying that they're not coming, but they have never come in the time frame that people put to it. You know, back when, <laughs> just to name a name, back when Bill Clinton was elected president. I mean, we're going back to 19, like 90, 1991, sometime in there. <laughs> I mean, I would kill to have Bill Clinton president again, considering how far things have slid since then. Even no, at the kidding. time, I was not a fan. <laughs> no kidding. I wasn't either, but I look at that and it's like, oh my gosh, you know, yeah, well, but, but again, people were convinced then because of such a great shift that this had to be it. This had to be the end of the Gentiles, you know, and it's like, it didn't happen then. Um, so I don't, I'm not here to try to predict when it's supposed to happen. But something important that you pointed out to uh, about kind of our saints in general, I think it's I think it's important that we have this hope that we can rebuild on the Book of Mormon. We can rebuild on the truth that is shared to us and for us from the Book of Mormon. We can take a deep breath. We can even take a step back if we need to, and we can say see this clearly or more clearly if we will allow ourselves to let go of some old paradigms. And I'm not saying step away from truth. I'm saying find the truth where it was really stated, like in these scriptures from Nephi and in these scriptures from Joel. And, and then take a step back from some of the things that people were saying in our in the day, which, you know, I, I have to share this honestly from the heart. I feel sorry for Joseph Smith. You know, and <clears throat> we shared scriptures from the Book of Commandments where it said, Translating the Book of Mormon will be your only gift. Don't pretend to any other. And and then I read many things where I feel like, man, was he just put up to this? Was he was was he being encouraged by people around him? You know, we need a revelation on this now. And it's like, I, I don't know. That's just my opinion. But but when I consider these things, I start to think, 
I, I don't know. There, there just weren't any sermons from the Book of Mormon. They were taking little verses and then they were putting their own spin around them. And that became the message to the people. And, and it could have been a different story, I guess. But I, I do feel a little, I don't know, a little pity, I guess, not because I'm looking down or trying to judge. But when I, when I read these verses, they, they give me hope now that we can come back to the Book of Mormon and we can realize what it was saying from the beginning and hopefully find some cohesion as a people and find some direction. But we can't do it if we're constantly confused, thinking that it's only 18 months away now, something bad is going to happen. I mean, people have been saying that for generations and it just hasn't happened that way. But those little short term, this is my testimony, something bad is going to happen in another 18 months or whatever it is now, those those work against us as a people. I don't think Nephi did that to his people, even though he was the one writing about blood and fire and vapor of smoke. I think his people understood that he was talking about these things are guaranteed to happen eventually, but maybe not in his day or even his. We talk life. about <clears throat> something bad, <clears throat> something bad happening, uh, but also as as you pointed out many times. God moves parallel, it seems, when something bad is happening, something good can be happening too. And and if you want to believe that, you know, in, in 18 months, you know, bad things are going to happen, I, it could also be, what if there is a really good movement? Because exactly. at some time there is going to be a good movement where, where people begin to see Jesus and these covenant people come to that knowledge. And I want to be part of, of something good, not always trying to be good because something bad is coming, but uh, man, when, I want to work alongside of people for this great event that's that's going to unfold. So, exactly. exactly, I think that's another mindset shift. Is um, not that we need to shape up because, or we're going to be harmed or killed or whatever. But it's like there's going to be some good people and a great movement of of hearts coming to know Jesus. And I don't want to be left behind. I want to be someone that can help teach, and and I I, I need to know Him myself in an intimate exactly. way to be part of that. So that's very important and, and gives me a lot of hope if I can strive for that. That's the bottom line, Mike. I mean, right there, if it's any example to us in our day, you know, the people who made the difference, who got the Lamanites hearts to change were indeed truly the Nephites whose hearts had changed. You know, they, they experienced Alma Jr. For instance, experienced this huge change of heart and he wakes up and he tells everyone about it. And that never leaves him. Um, I I don't know of many people. I would like to be one, I suppose, if, if that was possible. But it, I think that's what it takes. It takes people whose hearts have changed who can then go out to God's remnant and say, this is what you want and this is what you need to let go of. But it isn't the message that we've told them in the past that, you know, you got to come here to Zion right now because the world's going to collapse around you. I mean, that's been always it. It's been this quick, emotional, you know, make your move now or you won't get the chance sort of message. And it omits this greater truth that, no, you need to, you need to forsake your sin and be filled with the Holy Ghost and, and become a child of, of Christ. These, these are the true enduring messages that they have yet to hear. All right. Well, I hope I haven't derailed you too much, Corey. No, not at all. No, 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 it's good. It's all part of it. So, just a little more of this. I think it's it's interesting. So DNC section 28-2E, again, these are all RLDS references, but the hour is nigh, all right? So the and the day soon at hand when the earth is ripe, you know, and all the proud, it, it goes on. Now notice this, <clears throat> and they that do wickedly shall be as stubble and I will burn them up. Now notice this is nigh, and, and this is the continuation of this same verse from 1 Nephi 7 which do wickedly shall be as stubble and they must be burned. You see, again, these, these scriptures in the Doctrine and Covenants, when I read them in my youth, these were action scriptures. You know, that's one of the reasons why I'm living here. And I, I'm not saying, oh, we all gathered incorrectly or whatever, but, but I do think we just need to consider <clears throat> the source of these words. They, they weren't original to the 1800s. They were original to like 2,500 or so BC. And they were speaking in a manner to guarantee that 
all the proud would be laid down and only the Holy One of Israel would be lifted up. That day was guaranteed to come. The wicked would be as stubble, the righteous would be lifted up. But what we did, and this is one scripture of several, I'll, I'll show you this in another place, BC 65, 4b. I say tomorrow, all the proud, they that do wickedly shall be as stubble. I will burn them up. You know, DNC 28, 2e. I, I'm just reading from the text. I'm not putting my own spin on this. The hour is nigh, soon at hand. I mean, did you read these, Mike, growing up or have you in your life? I, yeah, I've, I've heard them quoted and it's the language. So when you said 2500 BC, my first thought was, well, Nephi was 600, but is Nephi quoting like Isaiah as well in that oh, first yeah. Nephi 7? Yeah. Right. So yeah, exactly. It's the I, language I, I of ancient. I, I'm sorry. I, I misspoke. I meant to say 500 BC or 2500 years ago, but you're right. Isaiah was about 200 years before him. So his words would have been about 2700 years ago. Correct. Yeah. I'm right. So we could say these the same language in the Doctrine and Covenants. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just uh, you know, the hour is nigh, um, tomorrow all this will happen. Yep. It's it's one. it's after the it's after the ancient language. It's just uh putting the correct timeline and and using that to to share the correct story, you know, not anyway. So we'll get into that. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, here's three scriptures that all have this phrase. The, the wicked will be burned as stubble. The wicked will be burned as stubble. I will burn them up. <clears throat> they do wickedly shall be as stubble. All this is borrowed from Nephi's writings, and it all comes from Isaiah's writings. And I, I want to qualify this a little bit because Nephi and his brother Jacob are skillful in using Isaiah and then sometimes intertwining their own words. And they'll go back and forth. <clears throat> and sometimes they'll say, for thus saith the prophet, and they'll quote from him. But um, I, I want to show you, as maybe it's towards the conclusion of our scriptures here today, about um, how Jacob does this in a way which, to me, I mean, it's kind of nerdy, but it, it blows me away to realize the Hebrew authenticity of it. But I will leave that for a little bit ahead. Uh, the, the Hebrew parallelisms are very authentic, as we'll see. But anyhow, these these words came from long ago, but they were transformed into these words, which were only a couple hundred years ago, that had everyone who was gathering to Jackson County and generations since then, all believing that, you know, it's like every day we wonder, is this the day when fire is going to come down and consume the wicked, you know? And it's like, it still hasn't happened, but but we have never reevaluated any of this. So, so um, the message is, the, well, sorry, the message is there's nothing wrong with the language it is the language of our god through the history of him speaking to our people it's the narrative that went along with that message in the modern day church instead of being the lord jesus christ is certain to return and we need to prepare and be ready it's uh, we have to build a righteous city and be righteous so that he can return and and then the narrative gets all of our lives out of whack so it's the narrative it's not the words in the scripture per se but but how we've right. used those to to paint a picture Right. And, and with that, so, and again, it's my opinion, but I can share enough evidence that I think you would agree that there are many bullet points. And let me say, you know, if I threw a word at it, maybe there's 30 things in history that scripture has pointed to that need to be fulfilled. And we talked about eight of them, and maybe there's more than that. But it's as if these early saints just read the first bullet point in the last bullet point and skipped all the ones in the middle. And it's kind of like, Oh, well, the Lord's going to burn his stubble and Oh, he's going to gather to Zion. Well, let's build Zion. And it's like omitting everything that the book of Mormon had to say about the people that would be that people, the people who would actually build it, the people whose hearts would have to change first. None of that was really considered in the early days of the church. It was kind of like, Oh, this book came to us. Let's write ourselves into the end of the story in a manner of speaking, and let's make this all about us. And it isn't. It isn't about us Gentiles, even though that's what our paradigm has taught us. So I'm all about just trying to lift the paradigm that has surrounded us and our people for a long time and say, okay, so what was the truth and what does that actually say? I, I think for, for some people, you know, this is a bumpy road. 
they, they don't want to consider that anything we believed in our past about ourselves is incorrect. Um, but yet, I can't read the scriptures any other way. And to me, they tell a beautiful story of hope that we've, you know, we've really prevented ourselves from seeing, uh, you know, the hope and the promises of God to all of his people. And this through the covenant he made with Abraham, stating that in his seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed, both Jew and Gentile. All right. Um, anything more on that? Or I'm going to go to the next little section here. Nope. All right. So, so getting back to this idea about fighting against Zion, this uh, is just a picture in Jerusalem. This on the outskirts of the old part of the city is a hill that used to be what was called Zion. And I, I got this from Bible study tools. I think, yeah, there's a source down here. Uh, these words here are simply from that Bible study tools page. But when, when I heard the word Zion, I'm going to back up to this, you know, Zion growing up, was this immediate thing that if you wanted to see, you had to be a part of Jackson County because there was going to be a wall of fire built up. And if you didn't get there soon enough, you wouldn't be inside and you better get there sooner because otherwise you're going to be walking barefoot, you know, from wherever you lived. And, and those words were words that, you know, I had heard in the 1970s, you know, in the 1980s, I, I acted on for my own self and, Maybe there's a greater plan that God has behind all these things, even if, I mean, we, we really thought when we moved here that, you know, we got here in the right year because next year everyone was going to be without food and barefoot. And, and, you know, Zion, this place in Jackson County was going to be the only place of safety. That's how immediate we believed these things to be. And so I, I always had this picture of an enclave here in the center of the United States. And that's what Zion was. And, and I still, I, I, in some ways, I guess I still kind of hold to that paradigm. I'm not saying that something like that won't happen or can't happen. <clears throat> God has had other ways of discussing Zion that we have uh, closed our eyes to, or we've been limited in thinking about, because once this paradigm's in place, it takes hold and its roots are deep. And it's hard to see this any other way. So what I want to do is I want to share a couple words about what Zion was historically that, again, we can then go back to the Book of Mormon and see what God's been saying all along about it. And, and maybe this can help shape our opinion. So, so Zion was this hill in the previous picture in Jerusalem located outside the walls of the old city. The term Mount Zion is found in the Old Testament. <clears throat> Uh, now, this is from the King James Version. You know, we, we have our own separate version <clears throat> in the inspired version, but I'm, I'm not here to comment on that. But if we take the King James Version for what it states, you know, it's, it's mentioned uh, in Samuel and in Kings and later the Temple Mount. But the point this author makes is that its meaning has shifted and is now used as the name of ancient Jerusalem's western hill in a broader sense. The term is also utilized for the entire land of Israel. So, so Zion became sort of a metaphor, first for the Temple Mount, later for the hill, later for all of Israel. And then we have a few scriptures that point this out from Samuel. Nevertheless, Daniel took the stronghold of Zion, that is the city of David. So the city of David was a smaller part of, of this Jerusalem area. Uh, the inhabitants of Jabez said to David, uh, you will not come in here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is the city of David. Um, and again, there's another one from Kings that kind of says the same thing. But but Zion was this maybe the stronghold part of Jerusalem back in, in its day. Um, so in the book of Isaiah from the King James, we get some more writing, and this is from Isaiah 29, not as it's been changed in the inspired version, but as it reads in the King James, which may or may not have its flaws. But I, I just want to point this out, that he's talking about the multitude of nations that would fight against Ariel. And this um, is sort of a parallel to Jerusalem and Zion, but all the, that fight against her and her munition and that distress her, shall be as a dream of a night vision. And so this seems to be describing a physical fight, you know, munitions and things, but it says, it shall even be as when a hungry man dreameth and behold, he eateth, but he awaketh and his soul is empty. 
or as when a thirsty man dreameth, and behold, he drinketh, but he awaketh, and behold, he is faint, and his soul hath appetite. So shall the multitude of nations be that fight against Mount Zion. Well, this, again, was from the prophet Isaiah, and one could definitely read this as a, a physical fight against Zion, but he's he's speaking metaphorically here, and he's talking about the the emptiness of people who are so certain in, in what they're doing. Like, for instance, you're dreaming, and if you've ever had a dream, and all of a sudden you think you're eating something, but you wake up and you realize, oh, that was just a dream. There wasn't any satisfaction from it, but but I thought I would have it. And maybe it's in that very moment when you're about to take a bite of whatever that is, that fruit or that pizza or whatever, and you realize you're just biting your lip. You're right. There's nothing there. Um, that's what he's saying. It's that emptiness that's going to come to people who fight against Mount Zion. That feeling of emptiness is what he's trying to convey. And he's not really stating it. It's in a physical sense, but it, it more of an emotional, like they're going to work really hard to do something and it's going to fall flat. That's That's the idea that's coming here from Isaiah. And so what I was curious about this because I saw this term fight against Zion in the Old Testament. And, and I also saw it in the Book of Mormon. And I'll show some of those scriptures in a little bit. But it occurred to me that as the Gentiles that I have been, you know, a part of my whole life and our, our nation and our, our centuries with the church now, um, we had this idea that fighting against Zion was this, again, picture of people who were in Jackson County and we were protected and everyone else outside us was, was evil and we were good. And that, that was the fight, right? But what's interesting, so I, I know we've talked about this, but I was curious. So I, I asked this uh, website, uh, openai.com, you know, it's this chat GPT or artificial intelligence as some people like to use it. It's not really intelligence other than it can do summaries of multiple books and sites and give you pretty accurate summaries or it can search the web and find a consensus on things, things that would take hours or years, even if you were doing it manually. Well, I asked this question. I said, what does the Old Testament term fight against Zion mean? And that was it. I didn't try to prep it with any of my thoughts. I didn't try to say and consider the Book of Mormon, too. But I just said, what does the Old Testament term mean to fight against Zion? I think that's literally the question I asked. And this is the response I got from OpenAI. It says, in the Old Testament, the term fight against Zion is a symbolic reference to the struggle between the forces of evil and the people of God. So I thought that was really interesting that it starts out. And again, this is just a summary of the Internet. It could be wrong. I, I would grant that maybe it's wrong. But, but listen how right it is when we compare this to some later scriptures. But it's stating that it's a symbolic battle. Zion was a hill in Jerusalem where the temple was built. Okay, we just established that from Bible study tools in that picture. It became a symbol of God's presence among his people. Over time, Zion came to represent not just the physical location, but the entire people of God and their spiritual inheritance. So I thought, you know, this is excellent writing. It's, it's very concise. And it states that Zion began to represent not just a place, but the people and everything they would inherit. And it continues. When the Old Testament writers spoke of fighting against Zion, they were referring to any attempt to undermine or destroy God's plan for his people. Now, it's important that we let that sink in because <clears throat> we, can, we can view that in an 1830s sense that Hey, we got to get here because people are going to fight against you and you need to raise up your sword or flee to Zion, one of the two. I mean, those were the words that were being stated. Um, but, but notice that it's any attempt to undermine God's plan for his people. This could take many forms, including military invasion, persecution of believers, or the spread of false teaching. Now, isn't that interesting? I had never considered this, and I just found this this week, that to fight against Zion... You could simply <clears throat> teaching incorrect things about Zion, right? You could be spreading false teaching. That's a form yeah. of fighting against Zion. Well, and yeah, consider, well, I was going to, if you, if you keep it just in the physical realm of, you know, takeover of a city, then that doesn't 
play out in Isaiah what he said because the physical city Zion was taken over. It was it was destroyed. <laughs> yeah. It was put brought captive. Uh, you know the Jews just recently were able to to return. So you, you consider that when Isaiah says that, you know, like you said, it's going to be wasted effort. Well, it wasn't wasted effort as far as capturing a physical location because that did happen. So we have to maybe broaden our, not, not limit it. Not that that won't be something in the future where you're protected in a physical place, but let's broaden our understanding and see what else it means. You know, that is such a good point, Mike. Um, I love your insight into that because, you know, think of it from a couple angles. <clears throat> what did the devout Jews think who knew Isaiah's words that many of them, if you were a Pharisee, you had it quoted. I mean, you, you, you knew these things from your heart that, um, Zion was going to, you know, be protected and God was going to fight this battle. And then they see Jerusalem decimated, not only in, you know, 600 BC, about the time Lehi leaves, but around 70 AD. And when the Romans destroy it, and when they destroyed it, it was a complete destruction. Uh, it, the the rules from Caesar, or I'm sorry, the, uh, the edict from Caesar, Caesar was not to leave a stone upon another stone. I mean, and Jesus kind of prophetically states that's how it's going to be. It was it was just a burned level field in the end. So this hill, you know, the, the buildings that were on it, they've been rebuilt in time since then. The, the reason when you see the Jews uh, praying at the Wailing Wall, well, it, it goes down and it goes down deep because it was the foundation of the original, the second temple, I think that's what it was. It was built after the Jews returned at about, you know, 530 BC. But this temple foundation was the only thing left because it was well down into the dirt it couldn't be seen by the romans who decimated everything so you're right if we're only considering the physical well the physical was already destroyed of zion so what does that leave us with we've got to see this as in a bigger idea spiritually and, and we can't go back to um just a narrow teaching of zion simply being this idea that gentiles had from good hearts to become righteous and secluded in, in the 1830s here in the center part of America. So, yeah, I think that's an excellent point you make. Well, it gives well, hope when I think that, well, go ahead. I don't want to distract no, you. No, go ahead. You go ahead. Uh-huh. Yeah. No. I'll say it's a changing of hope for the, for the Jews and the, you know, house of Israel, if they realize that, uh, you know, God didn't fail them all of those times by allowing them to be taken over. I mean, we've never had to be refugees thank God in our modern day time, but imagine what they felt like, you know, they have the words of Isaiah and then they're, they're several times taken away captive, brought back, the city's destroyed, brought back. Well, the same thing for us, only we're looking at it from a different perspective. We're waiting for it to be established and it continually doesn't become established. So it's a switching of a mindset brings hope and not that God's failing us or we're failing God. And so we're suffering, but it's according to the word and understanding the word correctly. And that, that when those two things align, then you have hope and trust completely in God. And you don't have this little voice on your shoulder saying, well, God's correct, but maybe we're not good enough. And then, so then doubt enters in because you can't trust God completely because you're bringing yourself into the equation and we're always going to let ourselves down. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and when we look back at the real promises that were given at the same time period, of these scriptures about fire and smoke and all these things, you know, it was, <clears throat> it was a real hope. It was a genuine hope. It, and it wasn't this contingency upon some attitude among a few Gentiles. It was a total change among all of God's people. <clears throat> well, so this spreading of false teaching could be fighting against Zion. And this ties in with things the book of Mormon teaches. So, um, this fighting against Zion, and again, back to the AI definition, is often used in the prophetic passages that warn of impending judgment uh, for those who oppose his people. Hey, I have to ask you, because one of my screens just went dark. Can you still see the main PowerPoint? Yep. Are you? Yep. Okay. All right. Yeah. That screen went dark on me, but I'm fine. So then it concludes, and it says, ultimately, the message of the Old Testament is that those who fight against Zion will not succeed. <clears throat> but this is a larger definition of God and his covenants. God is sovereign all, over all things, and his plans for his people cannot be thwarted. I think this is amazing 
<clears throat> that the definition is reduced down to this because <clears throat> the, the plan and the promise for Zion is God's plans for his people. Okay. That's literally what it meant back then. And that's what it means. And his covenants will unfold in a day to come where all these people hearts change back to God, just the way they did for the Nephites in the days of Alma. That's given to us in the Book of Mormon so we can see, hey, ha has it happened then? And has it happened in the jail of the Lamanites when they were about to kill the latter Nephi and Lehi? Their hearts are changed and they become missionaries and they become more righteous than the Nephites. That type of change is the promise of God and his plans for his people who thought they were forgotten. And, and in fact, God answers that in Isaiah's writings. And he said, I'll tell you this. He said, you think I've forgotten. He said, can a woman forget her sucking child? You know, can a woman who's given birth, who's been breastfeeding, can she forget about that child? No, there's no way. And I know we've discussed that before. It's not physically possible. Well, God comes back and says, yeah, you know what? They could forget, he said, but I won't forget. He said, I've graven you in the palms of my hands. He said, I will not forget this promise. And so God's plans will not be thwarted for the promises he yet has for Israel. But they, they weren't intended for the 1830s. And they weren't intended simply on a condition that Gentiles have held over ourselves that may or may not be exactly correct. So coming back now to DNC. We get a scripture, it's also from Doctrine and Covenants, section 45, 13a and c. It shall come to pass among the wicked that every hey, Corey. man... That... Yeah. So I don't think your PowerPoint's advancing. It's still on the fight against Zion screen. Okay, this one I'm going to do. Let me stop sharing something real quick, and then I'm going to restart my PowerPoint here, and I'll catch right up. Give me just a second. Okay. So I think I'm... I think I'm right here. hope this works. I'm going to start from the current slide. Uh, can you see that now? Well, you'll have to share your screen again or present your screen oh, yeah. again. Um, all right. Sorry about the technical goof here. Share screen. I'm just going to share. I guess I'm going to just have to share the whole thing. Um, my, my other screen, I don't know why this happened, but it just uh, it goofed up on me. But let me go into the PowerPoint here. So can you see that now? Yep. All right. <clears throat> just close so, that little box up there. Yep. Uh, so this fight against Zion from the Doctrine and Covenants, again, is brought back to an immediate condition that this is happening right now. It shall come to pass that among the wicked, oh, let me get my laser back up. Sorry. Every man that will not take his sword against his neighbor must needs flee unto Zion for safety. You know, these words loomed over me growing up. And it shall yeah, be Yeah, that was the one that really set in on me too. Flee to Zion for safety if you don't want to have to be a, in a battle. Exactly, exactly. And then suddenly we couldn't make sense of it. We're, we're within a few months of arriving here in the center place. All the saints were expelled under an extermination order that no governor of any state has ever even come close to, to uh, mandating any other time since then. But there was a promise then. So we were told to flee for safety. And it should be said among the wicked, let us not go up to battle for Zion, for the inhabitants of Zion are terrible, Wherefore, we cannot stand. So there's this idea of not fighting against Zion. All this put in my mind that the fight against Zion was about to happen. You needed to be here now. And the battle was going to be right on your heels. As you came in, the door was going to close right behind you. And, and again, I'm not trying to say this in a way to degrade uh, the Doctrine and Covenants or the faithfulness of saints who live before us. But again, the Doctrine and Covenants conveyed that these events were imminent and that the fight was about to be a physical fight for the city by Gentiles. So when I look at what the Doctrine and Covenant says now, when we look at it in the first book of Nephi, it's also stating 
this about fighting against Zion. It says, all they which fight against Zion shall be destroyed, for the time must surely must come, I'm sorry, the time surely must come that all they which fight against Zion shall be cut off. What is this talking about then? I mean, to me, you could use this in the same context to say, well, it's people gathering in to the city in Jackson County. But remember our definition from OpenAI that to fight against Zion means to literally be, um, to fight against the promises God has made or to fight against false teaching. This to me is beautiful. Blessed are the Gentiles of whom the prophet hath written, for behold, if it so be that they shall repent and fight not against Zion and do not unite themselves to that great and abominable church, they shall be saved. For the Lord will fulfill his covenants, which he hath made unto his children. And for this cause, the prophet hath written these things. And that should be a period, not a colon. But what, what's interesting about this is it's equating fighting against Zion with fighting against the covenants that God has made with his people. And, and when we expand these things, um, this is actually a little chiasm here, but I don't think I have it drawn out in the next slide. But, but um, yeah, maybe I, well, I'll see. I, I can't see my presenter view, but I just want to show this that Z to Jacob, who's writing about this in Second Nephi, to fight against Zion means to fight against the covenants. And that's how it's exactly defined here. They that fight not against Zion, you know, are, they're, they're not fighting against the covenants or the promises that God has made to his people. And so it gives me a broader understanding of what it means. And it, and it lifts me out of the mire that we still can't answer that question, or at least couldn't until maybe now that this whole idea among the early Latter-day Saints was, I'm sorry to say, incorrect timing. That Not that there yeah. won't be a sign, but that they were going to be the ones to make it happen. And well, I could, I was point out that verse 31, so I could hear people say, uh, or I, I, I could see the argument would be, well, you can't just get an uh, idea from a computer uh, to use a definition. Right. But what, what I saw was when it, when it said that, I felt a, a quickening, like, well, let's discover if the scriptures do back up what that definition was. And this verse 31, talking about the Gentiles, if it so be that they shall repent and fight not against Zion and do not unite themselves to the great and abominable church, they shall be saved. That's that's not talking about what well, we might think that's a physical thing, but it's if you're talking about being part of the church of Jesus or the church of the great the great and abominable church and and you know in the context of being saved, we're talking about the the inner man, your relationship with God and where you stand there. So it is a so then you go back to that definition and it, and it does hold true. It does. Exactly. Yeah. It, it totally nails it. And, and like, you know, you point out this part about the great and abominable church, you know, it hasn't fallen, but it's part of the prophecy that it will fall. But the whole idea is that the great and abominable church was this entity fighting against Zion who were the people of God. And where do we see that the most? Go study World War II history, and you find that Hitler was just carrying out an agreement he had with the Catholic Church in that day. And I, I'm not saying it's limited to that, but that's a great example of this, that uh, it's just come to historians' view in the last, I don't know, 10 years or so, as the Vatican has actually released, released documents showing how they had a pact with Hitler and you know, they're, I guess they're big enough. They don't have to be uh, ashamed about it or, or whatever. But the whole thing was, you know, Italy, for instance, was surprised. The people of Italy were surprised when they aligned with the Axis powers because they figured their job was to fight against someone like Hitler. But instead, Italy, that he, they, were, they were with Hitler, Mussolini and Hitler. They were the two bad guys. And it's because of the backing of that great and abominable church. So, um, you know, and I, I know I'm probably being politically incorrect trying to name a church with that. But, but again, <clears throat> the, uh, it, it all kind of stacks up leaning that way. But this, 
Yeah, the way I see that is that it's a spiritual thing, and the great and abominable church is, is any teaching that's not the pure teaching of Jesus, but at times in history that's manifested physically by those organizations that have power and, and great sway at the time. So, so, of course, it's carried out in the name of Christ in actual organizations, but it's also a deeper, you know, where's your heart at and, and, and who are you aligned to in the inner man, but it, certainly exactly. both physical and spiritual. And in the end, you know, Nephi sees, hey, it's just two churches. There still could be a hundred different names. But in the end, he says, you're either right. part of this great church, which is fighting against the covenants of God, or you're for Jesus and you are part of the covenants. Um, that's that's where we Gentiles of the latter days have just done ourselves a, a disservice, where I feel like we've missed out and um, not seen this greater picture of what God's plans are. But this scripture totally defines it, it agrees with that open ai definition this is what i love about it that um it's comparing and contrasting this fighting against zion with god fulfilling his covenants that he's made in his children and nowhere in any other scripture we don't get that laid out like this in the bible or even in the doctrine and covenants um but it's simply saying that fighting against zion is fighting against god's plans for his people so um, and this is just kind of restating everything that we just said. Um, Jacob's describing this worldwide effort and the doctrine and covenants was likely limiting our, our views to a battle in Jackson County. You know, sometimes I say that and it makes me just kind of feel bad even saying it, but it's, that's how limited we were in our view. Uh, we, we could have been a different people if we had really read the book of Mormon, I believe in the early 1800s. Uh, it could have shaped our destiny different, but I, I don't lose hope that it won't happen. It just hasn't really happened yet. So more of these verses from 2 Nephi 7 uh, and also 11, he that fighteth against Zion shall perish. He that fighteth against Zion, both Jew and Gentile, both bond and free and male and female shall perish. Isn't this interesting? So it's this idea that, hey, Jews can fight against Zion, you know, you can be a slave, you can be free, you can be man, you can be woman. But if you're fighting against the covenants and the plans that God has to restore his people, it's not going to go well for you. Um, all these verses have, have quite a bit to say about it. So it's all from the Book of Mormon. Now, these are my words, but I'm going to restate some things that we've already said. The, the people writing 1830s revelations were reading from the Bible and the Book of Mormon and concluding that all these events were immediately about to occur. I mean, do you think that's a fair statement, Mike? I mean, it's, it seems that. Yeah, I think it, I think it's still our, our main focus in hope as a, as a restoration culture, right? Yeah, Zion. exactly. Exactly. And it's, and it's not a bad, it's not a bad idea. It's not a bad idea. It's, it's certainly the, the idea of Christ living with a group of people together is a, is a good idea. And, but, and the, I was just going to say, and, and to your point, the Book of Mormon even makes this statement. It said, blessed are all they who seek to build up my Zion because they'll have the gift and the power of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. That's that's in Nephi's early writings. So it's like, and I believe that's the evidence of the truth within the restoration I'm talking about collectively, that we have had the Holy Ghost. We have had it, despite of our doctrinal misunderstandings. And, and I... I limit these things to doctrinal misunderstandings because, you know, there are a lot of people in the church whose hearts have changed. And I still think they get doctrine incorrect and, and we debate it. And sometimes people split over it, but that doesn't mean your heart isn't good. And I believe there are a lot of good hearts, but in the days when these things came out, they caused everyone to have an immediate focus you know, some of the phrases we've seen with these revelations that started in the Book of Mormon, they were rewritten to give an immediate context to it. And this created an emotional excitement that, as you state, it persists today, right? And people kind of scratch their head and debate these questions, which are ultimately unanswerable, that, uh, why don't we have Zion? What did we do wrong? And, and we seem to gravitate back towards this, oh, it's the condition of our hearts, so go home and get your house in order, and then we'll have Zion. All that totally skips over all the signposts. And I'm not saying it's not a great idea, but 
we're, we're ignoring a lot of facts if that's the only reason we think Zion doesn't exist. I feel like in order to have spiritual peace, we need to relearn from the source. And we need to work to remove some of these false paradigms. Uh, the 1830s revelations were preparing the hearts for an immediate event. But the Book of Mormon prophets were writing rather about the assurance of the events. Um, I want to do one more little comparison on that. Uh, and this comes from the earliest 2 Nephi 5, 39. They that believe in him shall be destroyed. I'm sorry. They that believe not in him shall be destroyed, uh, both by fire and tempest and earthquakes and bloodsheds and by pestilence and famine. Now, this is from DNC. 45, 6 C. And, and let me just highlight a couple of the verses. You see these words that we already kind of talked about, the tempest, the earthquakes, the pestilence, the famine, all these words were here in the doctrine or in the Book of Mormon first, before they were in the Doctrine and Covenants. These were the action words, the tempest, the earthquakes, the famines and uh, pestilences. But um, we also get this, you know, not many days hence, the earth is going to rem uh, tremble and reel to and fro like a dr drunken man. Again, the immediacy of all this works on our minds, but the source of this was the assurance that it'll happen, not the timeline that will happen when it was given in the Book of Mormon. So when uh, we're going to do a whole class on this, but I want to touch on two aspects of Hebrew parallelism. And just to be really quick, uh, the, the words antithetical and Janus, they're not words we really use in English very often, but, but what the antithetical parallelism refers to is when you have ideas that oppose. And now remember, a, a Hebrew parallelism is where ideas rhyme or uh, ideas are compared and contrasted. That was a great writing technique of the Hebrews to teach from and to learn from. And so you might see scriptures that deal with life and death or light and dark, you know, things that are opposite one another. And these two are from the Book of Mormon. He hath heard my cry by day. He hath given me knowledge by visions in the nighttime. So we see this opposite of the day and the night. And we see this heard my cry and his, the antithetical part is he's given me knowledge. He responds. I put up a petition. He gives me a, a knowledge. I do it during the day. He answers me at night. So there's antithetical parallelisms on a couple different levels here, just in this one verse. Another one from 2 Nephi 6, 74. Remember, to be carnally minded is death, and to be spiritually minded is life eternal. So the, I've, and I, it's not just me, but I've found well over <clears throat> 100 antithetical parallelisms in the Book of Mormon, just of that type. And that's just one type. There's many types of parallelisms. But... So that's antithetical with a couple examples. And then Janus parallelism, uh, it, it's, it's a little bit more technical, but it's where a verse or near verses will use a word that can have a double meaning. And it's a play on words, if you will, if you want to call it that. Uh, they're somewhat elusive in the Bible. Uh, they've been identified in recent times by Hebrew scholars, and I'm talking recent within like the last 40 years. No one knew about this. No one... There weren't any writings, anyhow, scholarly writings of any kind in the 1800s about Janus parallelism. Okay, that that just did not exist. But where where we see them used is um, like for an example here, Alma 19, where he's speaking to his son. And he says, "I desire that you should let these things trouble you no more. You know, to be bothered by something. Only let your sins trouble you." with that trouble which shall bring you down under repentance. And, and so what's going on here is a play on words with the, the idea of being troubled or bothered by something means this, it, it has a play on words where the word trouble also means to be convicted and changed. And so both meanings get played out by using the same words in the same sentence. It's, it's a little bit of a it's, like I said, it's a little bit more complex. It's a little deeper. But again, I've probably found 50 or 60 of these in the Book of Mormon. It's, it's full of them, and they're rare in the Bible, but they exist. Uh, it just shows the continuity between the level of understanding that the Hebrew writers in Israel had and the Hebrew descendants in America had. So 
Um, when I see anyhow, these things, every time you point these things out with uh, so many things that are attacked, especially for the LDS on their side of the aisle and people leaving uh, their traditions and sometimes leaving everything, is I, I just picture like Joseph Smith in a room writing these things down and the idea surrounding that he's making it all up to me is is so far away from reality and it's just a reminder that you can trust the translation of the book of mormon that he did with the interpreters that that the ancient hebrew culture people that came from that culture were the writers not him as a young 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 man uh day after day being able to consciously write this out and have it all fit together the way it does and be integrated that this yes. is something that you can use as a foundation not the book but but the words in there revealing who jesus is and and the basics of life you can trust with all of your heart that it's it's a pure message from god from heaven it, it truly is and it's literally this hebrew that is just really coming to the surface in the last 20 or 30 years well, I don't want to take anything away from people in the 1960s and 70s in the LDS church who began writing about this. The RLDS people began noticing it maybe from the LDS writings in the 1980s. And we did a little digging. Um, these things are my own. You know, once you get an idea that it, it exists, like you start reading a book on Hebrew poetry, it's like the matching game where all the cards are facing down mm -hmm. and you pick up the ace here and you find an ace somewhere else. You know, you, you read these things in the Hebrew scholars books and they're throughout the Book of Mormon. Um, and even, you know, it goes so far as to say critics who said things like, oh, well, Joseph Smith just uh, plagiarized from Ethan Smith's book uh, called, you know, A View of the Hebrews. That's where the Book of Mormon came from. And they just want to kind of say nothing to see here, folks, just walk away. Well, you can say that, but the problem is there are no Hebrew parallelisms in Ethan Smith's work. How would you get literally thousands of them in a book if you're if you were simply plagiarizing? There was no one else who was going to guide you in this back back in the day, and it's it's perfect and it's executed in in a grander scale than even the Bible is. And I only say that because the Bible's been interpreted and reinterpreted many times. It's gone through many hands. The Book of Mormon was translated by God's power once, and I will say this too: uh, <clears throat> there are a lot people who have been discouraged in the church and they've, they've left it all. You know, they, they leave the doctrine and covenants. They leave the idea of gatherings and they'll throw away the book of Mormon. And I hear this sometimes from like, you know, like I really re actually have a lot of respect for people like John DeLynn with his podcast, Mormon stories. And, and he's basically interviewing people who have left the church or who have something to say against the work of Joseph Smith. But I think you can cut too deep because in some of that work I've seen, and this is just my opinion, you know, come after me if you want, but I've seen them, they'll try to say, oh, and the Book of Mormon's faults, and then they'll quote something from Sandra Tanner or, or someone else. But what can't be refuted or disputed are these Hebrew parallelisms, and there's no answer for it. You, you can't show me a text that Joseph Smith plagiarized from and did these things so well that were done so perfectly. Um, we'll have more to say that like i said maybe yeah. the next time we'll go class on that. i think this is a good place to to state something Corey. <clears throat> when we started the podcast and it's been five years ago now can you believe that that yes. we were just having casual conversation and our hearts were for those who didn't have anyone to talk to and we thought let's just invite them into the conversation and uh but but as the years went by, things started to shift. And I can remember a point where you were showing up with almost a different Hebrew book every day. And I don't know, you, you probably ordered 30 or 40 within a, a several months. You, you began yeah. growing a collection. If you go back and look at some of Corey's classes he taught at Living Hope or Colburn or even some of our audio podcasts, you'll hear those things coming out. And I remember you made a comment one day. You're like, eh, I'm kind of preaching to the choir, maybe. I don't know if any of this is really helpful because we're already book of mormon believers and that thought rang true to me when i started diving in and really looking at history and wanting to know what was truth and what was not true and what sources to rely on and i got to a point where you really have to break everything now and say what is truth and that statement you made rang in my mind and i realized that hearing 
all of the things about a book that I already, you know, said I believed in, and I did, and I do, that those beliefs will be challenged, and you'll you will hear things, and just it was so cool because I'm like, there is a purpose for this among our people. Uh, I mean, of the whole Latter Day Saint culture, there is a, a a purpose for you studying that and other people bringing these things out because your foundation is shaken and what do you walk away from and what are you going to rely on? And you can still rely on extraneous teachings of Joseph. You can rely on the book of Mormon, but to me, the book of Mormon is, is true. And it's necessary to point these things out because I, my heart really hurts for those that are throw everything away and they're left floundering, you know, like, like I, I think John Dillon is, is probably an atheist or, or not sure, you know, Sandra Tanner, I really, think she's a, a lovely woman, a kind heart. She's a Christian, but she did, you know, throw away the Book of Mormon. And so it's it's a sad thing. Yes. Yeah, it is. Some of those people, I think, got who would throw away the Book of Mormon would get caught up in, just to name an example, things saying, oh, well, see, this scripture is very much like something in Timothy or in Galatians or whatever. And, and Joseph Smith plagiarized it. And it's like, no. The brass plates were the source of all scripture for them in the new world and in the old world. I mean, the the plates that Lehi had Nephi grab weren't the only set of scriptures in the world. And there were others, but the New Testament, like you said, copies from the Old Testament. We already stated that in the podcast. And the fact that these words are similar means that they were just quoting from a similar source without a reference. So anyhow, some pi- some people see that and then they quickly let it all go. But it's like, come back and see some of these Hebrewisms. I'd be glad to share more about them uh, as we go. But it's it's a truth that I don't think can be argued against. Well, I find so, value when you throw these things in from time to time, just as a reminder of how incredible this body of work is that we are able to hold in our hands and read from. I appreciate that. And I, you know, just to your point, I, that's how I begin every day. Literally, I, I don't know why, but I, I get up early. And sometimes I get up early with the thought on my mind of a scripture. And these scriptures are things that I haven't considered before. But I, sometimes I don't make it very far. But I'll spend a, a couple hours in the morning before anyone else is moving in the house, just with the Book of Mormon open. And sometimes just pondering a verse. And, and sometimes it's just been in recent days where these, I don't, I don't want to say these ideas come to me, but these principles become apparent and they become manifest. And so it's a, it's a been a, a beautiful walk because I don't think you can ever find the bottom of it. You know, the deeper you go, the more, the more comes up. And it's like, it's this amazing thing. I, I've got a notebook that's full of notes that I've taken just on these things, these Hebrew things that I've been learning. And anyhow, it's a fascinating study. It might be a, a kind of a, not a big deal to other people, but to me, it really supports the truth of this story. So Janus parallelism, that's just one example. Now, what I want to show us is when we <clears throat> look at this verse from 2 Nephi 5, which I shared, there's a little more context to it. What this basically is, is Jacob's writing, and he's quoting from Isaiah. But there's a little bit in here that isn't in the King James version of Isaiah. And I don't want to show you how it completes it because of the way he's got it written. And first of all, I'm just going to go to here. We can see the same verse. When we look down here, we'll see, I'll just read it through. They that believe not in him shall be destroyed, both by fire and by tempest, by earthquakes, bloodsheds, by pestilence and famine. So this has been sort of the basis of our verse all day long for this podcast. But I want to share the rest of it because it's really profound to me. They shall know that the Lord is God, the Holy One of Israel. And then he asks a rhetorical question, for shall the prey be taken from the mighty? Now that's that's this vision in my mind, like if a lion has a deer and it's planning to eat that for dinner, you know, what are your chances of pulling that deer out of its mouth? You know, probably none. Mm -hmm. That's the prey being taken from the mighty. Or he says, shall the lawful captive be delivered? Here's another scene given metaphorically, someone who is legally found guilty and they're put in a prison and it's just this barren dungeon and, and they're locked in there. Are they going to get out? Probably not. 
but what happens, and this is done in a, in a chiasm, that's the first part to show you, is, but God says, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away. So he's saying, hey, even, even the ones, and now his captives are his people, right? This is, this is all in the context of fighting against Zion. Even the people who were made subject by their Gentile enemies, they're going to be taken away by God. The prey of the terrible, you know, this deer in the lion's mouth is going to be delivered out of his mouth. That's what he's saying. And what's what happens is we get an antithetical parallelism here because he's asking this question and he's delivering an opposite response. So that's that's what makes it antithetical. So it's a it's a chiasm. It's an antithetical parallelism. And then what we get is a Janus parallelism. And let me give you the bottom. This verse right here, Jacob adds, it's not in the King James. And <clears throat> I believe that it may have been part of it. And it wasn't in the uh, canon of scripture that we have from the King James, which may have come from a different source. But when you consider what Jacob writes, it totally completes the chiasm because it begins, they shall know that the Lord is God, the Holy One of Israel, the highest of all gods. And the mighty God shall deliver his covenant people. So that is the bookends on this chiasm. But what's more is we get this Janus parallelism too, which is, again, it's just another level of magnificence. He's talking about the prey from the mighty, the, you know, the mighty lion, the captives of the mighty shall be taken away. The, the, the people, the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. So we get this presentation of the words mighty and delivered, but by human or by animal things. But how is it summarized in the end? For the mighty God shall deliver his covenant people. You know, it's this a total is crazy, play. Corey. This is so the brass plates, you know, had more complete or through time, the Bible missing the last key verse to the, to complete the chiasm is only found in the Book of Mormon. Exactly, exactly. Explain that away, uh, detractors exactly. of Joseph Smith. It's exactly. like, wow. Like I say, come at me, and all I'll do is I'll show you Book of Mormon scripture. You know, it's like this stuff gives me chills. And I just saw this literally yesterday, and, and it's like, oh, my gosh. And it's, it's just, I don't know why, but it, it just, I don't know. To me, it tells the truth. It's a beautiful telling of it. It's done in a way that is not done in any other book of scripture on earth presently at this time. And it's all about... What we come back to, fighting against Zion is fighting against God's covenants and his plans for his people. It's a much bigger, more beautiful idea than anything we've allowed ourselves to think of so far. It's important to complete the thought process, too, because you find something like this that's just so cool. It's not to say, now I can prove the Book of Mormon's real. It's like, okay, I can trust this book. Now, what is the message and how can I implement it with complete trust in my life so that I can be changed? Exactly. And sometimes we stop at the first thing of just proving the book is true and getting into debates. But man, it's not about that. It's about being able to trust it with all of your heart and make it your standard and, and, and what you're going to rely on, on how you know about God and what you should be doing in, in your relation with him and others. Exactly, exactly. So um, this is just an example of this, that, you know, it's all about God's covenants to his people. It's not the limited view we've given it. Uh, there, there's no way you can, you can say this doesn't exist, you know, and, and like you said, to have a statement like this where the chiasm's completed only in the Book of Mormon. I mean, how beautiful is that? Um, now, again, th and this is my last slide here, just summarizing, Jacob and Nephi's writing drives home a larger message larger than all the saints of the 1830s believed that Zion was then to be established. But <clears throat> it's larger in that God has a mighty plan in fulfilling his covenants to all the house of Israel. Early saints wrote according to the Book of Mormon in part, but put their own timeline to it. And that is not correct. When And again, this is where I kind of feel sorry for Joseph Smith in a way, if he was being put up to this. But this idea of this this imminent pending doom, it, it just wasn't part of what the Book of Mormon was saying, at least not then. It gave a lot of conditions that had to be satisfied before this final day. But when Zion's purposes are fulfilled, all the signposts must be fulfilled. 
Uh, we cannot will them to happen. We can't just hope it happens. Um, they all happen when God sees fit. And that term is what the Book of Mormon says. They happen in God's time when he sees fit. Um, the prayers of the ancients, the ancients like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Lehi, these people were that their descendants' hearts would return to God. And that ultimately needs to be our prayer too, that their hearts return to God on the same. So let me um, let me get out of this and let me get back to being here. I'm going to stop sharing the screen. Here we go. So, so what yeah, I'm that's... hearing today is uh, is the... Uh... Oh, go ahead. No, that, I was going to say that's it for today. Go ahead. Yeah. So not leaving behind our idea that there could be a holy place. There, there probably will be a holy place where people are with God and maybe there's some physical protection, but expanding and broadening the idea that there's also a very important point when we're talking about fighting against Zion. And that is going against the plan God has for his people that he wants to covenant with and that he's made covenant with and keeping those things in context and not changing the story is important. Yeah. It's the whole story. And I feel like in our telling of it in generations past, we haven't told the whole story. You know, we haven't talked about the covenants. Maybe we don't understand the covenants. Um, it's always worth looking at more closely. So in a but, sense, we we could be ourselves fighting against Zion by not doing that. See, exactly. That's exactly it. And I look at these ideas <clears throat> that have been generated among our own people. I mean, our own peers, Michael, we've had conversations. Unfortunately, some of them haven't really ended on a happy note with people who are just so convinced of the writings of the saints since 1830 that they don't want to consider it any other way. And to bring up the covenants in the plan that Zion is, you know, a greater thing than we've ever been told. Um, it's like that in and of itself, just holding on to these past traditions is exactly like you say, it's, it's fighting against Zion in a way, even though we think we're living for it. Right. Well, thanks for sharing that, Corey. This is a, this was an interesting, interesting one. We've got some, education on hebrew and language and got our faith strengthened in the book that it's divine and have a new way maybe to start meditating and praying about fighting against god's plan and am i aligned with his plan or am i aligned with maybe some traditional thinking because i don't want to yeah. be one fighting against god's plan yeah exactly me neither uh, i'm going to make a pdf of this powerpoint presentation and i'll give you the link mike i'll put it on restored gospel but, um, okay. You can download it for notes. You can have it. Um, yeah, we said guess, we were. Well, we saying, said we were going to make a little tutorial. Maybe every every broadcast, of just a little something people can see on RestoreGospel.com because that's a great website with great resources. And I don't know if we all take advantage of those. Yeah, that's right. I didn't really prepare one this time, but we'll we'll do it next time. I'll show you a couple more things you can do with it. Um, and next time we get together, I think we will. Uh, try to turn back to the class material that we didn't finish at Living Hope and finish that presentation. That'll probably take two or more presentations on podcast to do. But I'm excited about that. Right. And I, I thank you for the opportunity. And it will probably be another little bumpy ride, but, it, but it, my only thing is <clears throat> the Book of Mormon has shared a story from the beginning that I don't believe we've told. And <clears throat> I'm not here to downgrade anything that's happened in our past or to dismiss people who worked so hard for what we have. But I feel like the idea of, of God's kingdom as it's presented in the Book of Mormon is one we need to learn and understand so that we can share it. And so anything I say, I'm going to be able to compare it back to the Book of Mormon. And hopefully you can see the, uh, the logic behind all that. Too. So look forward to the next time. And uh, guys, just keep walking each other home. We appreciate all of you that join us and reach out in comments and emails. So keep them coming. It helps direct some of the conversation. So until next time, God bless. Mm -hmm.